Uh, let's introduce the host of this particular segment. Uh, you press, okay, I see you there. There you go. I'm Wuna. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Brother Sal. Lila Tov. Good night to all. All praise be to the Most High. It's good to be back and have this beautiful, edifying, and sometimes controversial conversation. So, I'm Amunia Israel on all social media. Shalom to everyone. All right, we appreciate you. And, of course, I introduce the home panel. We have my brother, Awal. Welcome to the show. Hey, shalom, Big Sal. Shalom to my sister and all praises to the Most High in Christ and all Israel scattered abroad and far. Greetings. Brother Awal. What's going on with you, Awal? What's happening, brother? What's going on? I'm good, I'm good brother. You know how we do. I'm, I'm good. Awesome. Everything's good. All right, all right. And let's introduce uh, Mayana. Welcome to the show. Hey, shalom, everybody. Hey, Sa. Hey, Muna. Shalom, Owa, and the listening audience. How is everybody? Hey. hey. All right, and the Quente, if you out there, you got to press number one. We have a lot of people on the phone lines. You got to press number one, and uh, we'll bring you in. Um, but um, I guess, uh, you know, since it's a late little start, let's jump right into it, Muna. Get it started, guys. Right? <laughs> All right, but also maybe move to the conversation. This is the Relationship Challenge. And now we have a sister show that's called Under the Palm. And in both of these segments and um, different capacities, we speak to issues that are, are plaguing our community. You know, um, we have plenty of topics that we have touched upon. And if you've missed those, you can go to Under the Palm as well as debate to a few. I want to preface that because we have a lot of new listeners and they may be like, oh, they're not talking about this, they're not talking about that. So if you have a, a question about a lot of things we already touched on, you can feel free to um, just mosey on over there and see what it is we have and bring your questions or comments. Today we're going to talk about something we probably brushed over, but we really didn't speak directly to, which is the Jezebel. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Even when you say her name, it just sounds like Eve. Venom is just... You know, when you say this name, you know, the, the, you know, people are supposed to shudder. You know, she's supposed to run. Um, this, and we're going to look at Jezebel. Is it truth or trope? Is this something that people are, are repeating over and over again? Has Jezebel morphed into something that's totally non-biblical? You know, and who was this biblical character of Jezebel? But before we do all of that or any of that, I kind of like to feel the temperature in the room to see if we can find out when we say the word. Because the, the, the funny thing is that when you say a word, each individual has a different picture in their mind. That's just how word association works. And sometimes we come into conversations and we begin to argue, stumble over our words or understanding because we don't take time first to see what it is you are thinking. And because this is part of working on our issues as a community, we practice that here. So what we're going to do first is go around the table. And for the listening audience, when I say the word Jezebel, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Because usually not the one that you got to brush over and try to pretty it up. No, the first thing that comes to your mind when I say the word Jezebel. So I'm going to go to Brother Award and I'm going to come to Sister Mayana. Did we have another guest on the panel? I'm not Sure, if we had another, I can't remember if we had another guest. But if we did, I have to, uh, I have to do some back office uh, conversation. But for right now, I'm gonna come to Brother Award, Sister Mayana, and Brother Quincy. If you're out there, feel free to press one. Oh yes, Brother Matia, but um, he's not on us yet. So Brother Award, when we first say Jezebel, what's the first thing that comes to your mind, Brother Award? Hold up, stand by. Uh-huh. Hold up, hold up. Somebody just press number one. I don't know if this uh, Brother Matia. I don't know. Let's find out though. Let's find out. Matter of fact, uh, Mayana, what's the first three numbers? <laughs> you know the first three numbers. Uh, let me let me get that for you. All right, um, all right. So go, you know, we'll go ahead and then you and I'll do some back um, in the green room. We'll we'll work that out. Oh well, go no, ahead. I got it. Oh, 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 okay. Oh, so, yeah. Um, well, when I was a kid, and I used to hear people throw that phrase around uh, Jezebel, like I remember on the Sanford Sun, they used to say that in different shows, it was referenced as like being a harlot, but when I come in Israel and I've heard people reference that phrase uh, it's used in a context like uh, a, a woman that uh, a woman that's bringing in some form of heresy that they're trying to influence other women, I've seen it being used in that context so 
that's another thing. So I, I don't really know what, you know, I really want to know really what really people, then there's a biblical definition, which kind of, you know, I kind of see where people are trying to make a correlation with it, but I, I, I just want to really hear out, you know, because I don't use it. So I just want to really hear what, you know, the different context of how people use it, and that's all I'm going to say on that. Thank you for that award, and, and thank you for mm. your transparency and your honesty as it relates to it, because this is a topic um, that, and I'm coming to Sister Mayana, this is a topic that some don't use the term. Like, I don't use, you know, the term to, but then we have others who do. And so, like you said, for some it will be like something in passing, and for others there's a deep wound there. You know, either the male is saying it to the female or the females are saying it to one another. And so we're going to uh, hopefully discover some of those areas tonight and hopefully bring it to light. So, Sister Mayana, you hear the word Jezebel? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Well, for me, um, the things that come to mind are, are two-pronged because very often the use of the word, the use of the name is, is two-pronged. And that is that there is the the authentic biblical context for Jezebel and there's the uh, religiosity that has uh, enveloped that authentic um, person. Then there's also all of this historical baggage that comes with the usage of Jezebel. And so when I hear it, it would depend, it it always kind of uh, resonates with me because I hear people using it and I wonder if they if they are aware of the connotations. Very often it's, as the was said, it's usually applied to a woman. I've seen that recently it has um, morphed into something that could apply to any gender. It's and, you know, As the conversation continues, we'll look at these usages and um, to what degree it resembles the authentic individual that is discussed in, in Kings and later referenced um, in Revelation. All right. So well, that was the voice of Sister Mayana. What comes to mind when you first hear Jezebel? Uh, thank you for that. Is Brother Amatia on the line? Not yet. Amatia is uh, okay. not online yet. Okay, he's not online as yet. And so that's that's really the opening uh, as we're having this conversation. And I guess the first place to start, since the first place, if you're coming from a biblical context, that you're going to see this name and you're going to see this character is in the Bible. And so, yes, I understand that modern media has... Uh, spawned her as well as antebellum slavery has given her a new face. You know, every time you get a, after 20 or 40 years, you get a facelift. So throughout the years, Jezebel has morphed into these different characters um, and has these different applications. So if we may, I'm going to start with Brother Award. What do you remember about Jezebel in the Bible? We can, truth or trope? This is what we're trying to discover today. Truth or trope, and if you're out there, and you have some input, we're going to come to the audience early, so feel free to press 1 so you can get in the queue. And, and after we do this round, we're going to come to the audience. So, Brother Awar, what are the first things you remember, or if any, you remember about the Jezebel story in the Bible? Well, um, what I did, because like I said, I really, I, I had to refresh, you know, because I haven't read it in a while, so I have the a little meaning right here. I can read a little bit of it, and this is in the... Then when Bible Dictionary says uh, Jezebel, it says uncertain. Well, it says okay, daughter of Ezebel, king of the Zidonians, queen of Ahab, king of Israel, around 875-853 BC. She had been brought up as a rebellious worshiper of Baal, and as the queen of Ahab, she not only continued his ancestral religion, but tried to impose it upon the people of Israel. To place her, Ahab built a temple and an altar to Baal in Samaria, and this was found in 1 Kings 16:32. 450 prophets of Baal ate at her table. 1 Kings 18:19. She showed all the prophets of Je- uh, this is Jehovah on whom she could lay her hands, and this was 1 Kings 18:4-13. When she was sold of the slaughter of the prophets of Baal by Elijah, she threatened his life, and he was obligated obligated to flee. In 11 Kings 9-7, we are told that the slaying of Ahab's family was a punishment for the 
persecution of the prophets of the Most High by Jezebel. Later, she secured Nabal's vineyard for Ahab by causing his owner to be judicial, uh, what does that say? judicially uh, murdered. It says, 1 Kings 21. When Elijah heard of this crime, he told Ahab that the Most High's vengeance would fall upon him and that the dogs would eat Jezebel's body by the wall of Jezreel. But there's a whole bunch, but that's, you know, I was just reading that. I was like, wow. And she was really a very corrupt person and was violating the Most High. And what's crazy, right, I was in a debate yesterday, and there's a lot of people that surpass the things she was doing back then as far as following that idol. And now there's people just in regular day life that have done 30 times worse than what she's doing. And it's getting way worse. So I just want to put that out and I just pass the mic. All right. Thank you for that. Um, and we're hearing a little bit of feedback. I'm not showing whose background that is, but if it is uh, yeah, background. Yeah, I mean, there's some background noise as well. Uh, if anybody's not uh, speaking, Mute your mics, mute your phones. Oh. Off the point of oh. background noises. Get yeah, mute your phones. I appreciate okay. it. What number you at the first six? Oh. Yep. Yeah, I'm still <laughs> What number? What number you at the first six? You at the six? Oh, or the, what number is it? Yeah, I don't know. Oh. You're on your phone? I, I, I'm not sure. But I can mute you. Okay, I, I can mute you. Just to, you know, yeah, I can no, mute you. You mute me. Uh, me. I don't know. Where All right. There we go. I'll mute you. All right, there, guys. That, that ladies. All right, thank you for that. So that was Brother Award giving us a little refresher out of the Bible dictionary of um, Jezebel. We're definitely going to go into some of the things that oftentimes we, we some of us don't consider until we're having this discussion. So thank you for that, Brother Award. We're going to come to Sister Mayana a little bit uh, off the dome about biblical Jezebel. We're going to go around, we're going to touch the audience, and then we're going to go a, a few levels deeper. So biblical Jezebel off the top of your head, Sister Mayana, um, can you share anything with the audience that you remember about her story? Absolutely. Since Jezebel is one of the more uh, visible of the, the female tropes, and I think that maybe we need to define trope for the listening audience, but it's a it's a it's a type of stereotype. It's um, uh, I don't have the biblical de- or the literal definition in front of me, but it's the idea that there's a the metaphorical use or an expression, um, of a thing rather than its actual um, usage. In this case, we're talking about a real person, but she has adopted or as um, Amuna said, received a facelift over time and context. And so that's why we're talking about whether or not we're going to deal with the truth of who Jezebel was or or, or is it mostly trope now? Are we using this word habitually and, and, more, and more metaphorically? Maybe, you know, just because we've heard it and we just use it because it's in popular usage in particular ways. And so I think that a lot of that is – I really appreciate that Awar read that because even just listening to it, I was reminded of all of the ways that the the pulpit has gotten it wrong. Uh, Jezebel was a foreign princess. She was born in a foreign land. She did not. She wasn't corrupted in any way. That is who she was. That's who she's always been. Her father was the king of a foreign space. He, according to Josephus, he was a priest of of Baal. So. When um, Jezebel married Ahab, she didn't become corrupt. Neither did she corrupt Ahab, which is another thing that needs to be said outright. Um, Ahab was several generations deep in the worship of idols. The moment uh, the kingdom split after Solomon and Roabim and Joabim, uh, the northern kingdom immediately fell into idolatry. Their king, Jeroboam, had... um, insecurities about his leadership of the people and in fear that they would go to Jerusalem to to worship and thereby reestablish the the Davidic empire he created local deities the, in, in the form of calves and told the people these are your these are your 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 gods and so you don't have to go anywhere worship here and the people agreed this is the very first king and that didn't change as other kings came into in, into power and so when his father Omari came into power, they were there was already an established uh, custom 
of moving away from the true and living power, uh, our, our creator, and embracing all of these foreign um, ideas and foreign deities. And so Ahab, you know, we, when we're introduced to Ahab in the, in, the, in the account, it says that, you know, he exceeded the evils of the others and, and exceeded even all of his, his own um, evils by marrying her. He, no, it said that it, it, was not, it was considered, he considered a light thing to marry Jezebel, something to that effect, again, because you're asking me to go off the dome, um, but that he married her. And it wasn't that she came and corrupted him. He was well corrupted already. And so uh, without, like, revealing everything, and I'm, I'm sure that your own, when you, when you come in, you can add more to it. But I think to, to begin, we should establish that the biblical Jezebel was a foreign princess and brought with her all the things that you would expect a foreigner to bring with her, which is her past, her, her parenting, the way that she was reared as a child. And this was her religion. And she stayed true to her religion. And it wasn't something that was contrary to her husband's ideology at the time. And we'll speak more about how marriages um, are constructed and, and the, um, the inclination to blame Jezebel for the misdeeds of Ahab. Uh, one of the things that I heard a was def uh, reading definition from the dictionary say that it was because of Jezebel's killing of the prophets that she was later pronounced to have um, dogs eat at her. But this is actually not because of the of the prophets. So when Elijah kills the prophets, it's actually after the um, the this, the taking of um, Naboth's vineyard of his of his. Um, ancestral lands that this curse is pronounced on the family. And so we're going I think this is why we asked, you know, is there truth is this truth or trope? And how much of the truth gets buried under the mythology and how and we're going to talk about why that mythology has become so important in um everyday conversation. Thank you for that. And and thank you for that, Sister Mayan. And the reason like you said, the reason why I asked to go for the dome because more often than not, this is where we get into arguments at, that we're remembering bits and pieces of the story. Like Awar said, he had to go back and look at the story. We kind of don't remember. And so even as those who may be biblical scholars, who may be students of the Torah, who may be in conversations, quote, debates, Facebook, social media, oftentimes we're going from, wow, I don't remember that part of the story. And so me asking for off the head is to see how much we remember or do not remember and hopefully mm -hmm. – introduce an environment where we can have a little bit of humility as we rehash the story and go through whether or not it is truth or trope. Why is this important? Again, like I said, because some congregations, some leaders, some teachers use Jezebel as a beating stick, as a, mm -hmm. you know, the boogeyman, as a way to subjugate um, other women and brothers in the congregation, because you may have a brother in the congregation who, who's listening to the to his wife, or they have a good relationship, and say the leader doesn't want that to be the case. The leader wants to be in that relationship, the head of that family, and so he may say to him in passing, you know, your wife is acting like a Jezebel. Now all of a sudden, boom, the power is back in his hands. Why? Because who wants to act like Jezebel? Right. Even if it's not applicable, even if it has nothing to do with her, the simple fact that she's labeled as such now begins to erode uh, something within their relationship. So this is not just, you know, why are we talking about this? It has nothing. People's lives have been adversely affected by this uh, stereotype, and we need to get down to the truth of the matter. So thank you for that. I'm going to go to the phone lines right now and see if anyone wants to weigh in. If you weigh in on, on this early round, please... Uh, say either one of the two, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? And I'll just, just so that we don't confuse it, if you're going to call in, we're glad to take your call, keep it clean and professional and all that nice stuff. But the first question we're going to ask is, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Brother Sal, do we have anyone on the phone line? All right, let's go to the phone lines. That number to call in is 319-527-6239. Once again, if you want to call in, the number is 319-527-6239. Press number 1 if you have a question or a comment. Uh, let's go to the phone lines. Let's go to 313-695, live on air. 
Shalom, shalom. This is Ima Yahudi. Shalom, sisters, uh, Imuna and Mayana. And Hello, sir. Imuna. <laughs> yes, I had to be here. Hope I can be a little of uh, assistance here. Yes, I really agree. The first thing come is cunning. When I think about Jezebel, cunning. And both of sisters have a point in terms of how it's, it's misread because he was just as corrupt as she was. She was just coming from her background, her heritage. She was a queen. She was a royalty of the Phoenicians, I believe. They even had mm-hmm. a coin from her uh, by her. It's a um, a opal Phoenician seal coin with a symbol on it, and it and and it's of uh, the name Jezebel, and it's the ninth and eighth centuries. But what was interesting, I think it was one of her sons. He felt that he was, I think, Jehu, J-E-H-U. Jehu. Yeah, he was very powerless. He killed Jezebel and safely buried her remains. Even in her death, she remained, now listen to this, ruthless, but a royal woman. And when I think about this story, and I've read it over and over again, is you know, that Traditionally, it's been used as a byword to use to say wicked women or wicked woman. And actually, it takes two. So, therefore, how can we break that stigma to say that she did what she was brought up to do? She was just against the most high because that wasn't her. But then again, it said, and I can't remember what scripture, uh, not to marry someone that. Is, is not of your kind means don't have don't have similar likes, you know. If you marry someone from a different nation per se, and we get stuck on the color and not looking at the content, of, excuse me, or the content of the person's character. So this is an interesting discussion because it will bring out a better understanding of relationships between male and female. Uh, that's all I have to say for right now, Zehu, and I am so glad to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you for that, Dr. Uh, and mm-hmm. she brings some very good points. Um, when she said that uh, the wicked, and I remember coming up hearing, the wicked woman is a pusher to the wicked man. You know, the Ecclesiastes out of the Apocrypha. And so often the, the conversation is Jezebel was wicked because Ahab was weak. You know, and so he's weak. We just, ex- you know, excuse him. He was weak. But let's look at her wickedness. And the point that's being brought up, and no, we're not trying to absolve Jezebel. We're trying to put her back into context that going for to make this, whether it is a political alliance, which we'll discover, you know, we'll have a conversation about as we go on, but going her in and of itself, knowing where she's coming from, what her family background is, was the first wrong move. And so this plague, so to say, that was brought in on Israel, on the prophets of the Most High, on Elijah, all of this was started by Ahab, mm-hmm. it, because he's the one who brought her into the kingdom. Now we don't know; the Torah doesn't reveal how or what was the, you know, the conditions of which she came, whether or not she came willingly, whether or not she was a. Um, you know, a political alliance, which more than likely it is, because the story goes on to tell you, you know, what was going on in this that space. So when we're looking at this conversation, we have to put it back into historical context. I just have to say that, but Brother Sal, for those who are on the line, if you would like to press one, when we say Jezebel, what is the first thing that comes to mind? I really push the mic. All right, let's go to the next caller. Let's go to three four seven three zero three. You're live on air. Shalom, this is Sister Aisha. Shalom, how are you guys doing? Hi, Shalom, Akoti. Hi, oh, what's going on? Shalom, Akoti. And bro- um, the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of Jezebel, I think of my church days when they would call people out, so to speak. <laughs> so, I think of a whore. And this would be you, you whore. And it's interesting that you guys bring up that it wasn't that she was a whore. She she was, you know, she was a foreigner and she believed in idol worship and her values were probably different than the values of 
than the values that Israel was supposed to have. But they used it to kind of use a use a, a stereotype or a personality that I guess to scare the woman into behaving properly or whatever the case is and not really looking at once again, just like today, a lot of our brothers go and get women that are not of this way or maybe women that they know from jump street are women who behave a certain way. And then afterwards they sit there on YouTube and Facebook and cry about it. But meanwhile, they knew that the women had all these negative characteristics from the beginning. And, and, and a lot of times Yisrael doesn't hold the brothers accountable. They just talk about how wicked, like Amuna said, the sister is, and this brother, he's weak. And she used her, her feminine wiles to, you know, sway him and, but absorbing the brother, absolving the brother, excuse me, of any responsibility. And, 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 and a lot of times that is the way the scriptures were taught. Look at Adam and Eve. It was taught the same way. And it, 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 it describes our brothers as, it's like a contradiction because in one extent, they want to teach us, oh, we are strong, you know, they're strong Israelite men. But then in the next extent, oh, well, he can be, swayed because a woman can be seductive and sway him in his journey. So, you know, it's kind of a contradictive way of teaching. So Amuna and Mayana, you guys do have a point with with what you're saying. But anyway, but that's the first thing that comes to mind, a whore. And that's what I was taught. And that's what, you know, was usually used to describe a Jezebel. Thank you. Thank you for that, and that's that's what we want to get to. How did how did Jezebel become synonymous with whore? And again, like you said, the church has um, played a major part in pushing forward this narrative, and now we're we're here to discover: is it truth or trope? So, Brother Sal, thank you for that, Sister Aisha. Brother Sal, do we have anyone else on the line at this point pressing one to answer the question: What is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the term? Jezebel. You have to say it. You have to say it. You have to make it sound like. <laughs> yeah. You got to put the Brother, stink on it. Yeah, you got to put the stink on the back end. Jezebel. Brother Sal. Yeah, um, apparently there's nobody else pressing number one at this time, but we do have a lot of people listening to the show. Again, if you have any questions or comments, that number is 319-527-6239. For those of you that pressed one before later on, if you want to uh, answer another question or you want to make another comment, just press number one two times on your phone, and I'll put you back on the switchboard. But go ahead, Amuna. Okay, so we, we have heard of this Jezebel. The first thing that comes to our mind sometimes is what we've been taught what we've been exposed to via the media, via the religious organizations, you know, conversations within the home. And so now we're going to spend a little more time before we go on to how she has morphed. We're going to spend a little more time uh, to have the conversation about, as we already started, who is this Jezebel? And I don't want to beat it into, but please go back and re, and, and revisit the story so that when when we go forward, we can understand where the narrative went off. And I do believe she was once again, or this name, and Sister Mina can expound a little bit more um, when we get to that point, that the name Jezebel reappears in the New Testament, and from there it takes another direction. But I'll go to Sister Mayana right now. We did hear a little bit about it, so let's get a little bit more about Jezebel, the son, I mean the daughter, the princess, the Phoenician princess, and, you know, what she was doing, was what she was doing out of order as it relates to the society that she grew up in, or was she doing what she was trained to do? Sister Mayana. Well, according to the text, that she was, you know, very much in line with what the Phoenicians of the day were doing. It would be actually counter uh, countercultural for her to have not been uh, a worshiper, an ardent worshiper of Baal, which was uh, the Baals, all of the Baal gods of her space, because she was not only a citizen uh, of Sidon, uh, she was the princess of Tyre. And again, according to Jophesis, her her father held the position of high priest over these deities. And so for her not to be worshiping in accordance to what her family had worshipped, this is not something that she had, had, you know, invented on her own. This is something that is ingrained in her culture. And so she is coming from her culture into this marriage 
And I think we do want to uh, speak briefly about how marriages were constructed at the time. Uh, there's no real difference in terms of we have to, first of all, contextually, let us, let us understand that Solomon, by this time, would have been infamous. The idea of treaty marriages would not have been something that is unfamiliar to um, other people, other kings, or, or Israel at large or the nation as, as a whole, that would have been something they were quite familiar with um, due to the position of, of Israel as, a, as a, a participant in trade, as being surrounded by enemy, uh, you know, cultures and enemy ideas. We have the Assyrians, the Egyptians, um, Moab and Ammon nipping at our, our heels. And so for her to be coming out of this Canaanite-based culture, um, this idea of a treaty marriage between them, isn't is not far fetched. Additionally, we have to also recall that marriages were not done by uh, women, and you know, for the most part, women didn't initiate marriages. So this idea that she set out to seduce him and that she is the one that did anything, it, it's unlikely because women were um, given in marriage by their families, by their fathers, and by their families. And so the likelihood that she is the one that initiated any union with um, Ahab is unlikely. And so when Amuna said that we don't know to what degree she was um, the one, how much she wanted to be there, we do know this eventually happened and that uh, the father is fine with it. And Ahab is fine with it. And this idea where we, and we heard the caller saying, and I think we need to revisit this idea that we victimize Ahab in this. Poor Ahab, he gets overwhelmed by this extremely um powerful personality and that he succumbs to something that he wouldn't normally succumb to, but that isn't biblically accurate. The, the account tells us very early on, I believe that it begins in First Kings uh, 12, 13, I think in 12, that, um, that the first king of the northern kingdom immediately falls into into um, idol worship, I mean, immediately, the very first king. And there's no deviation from that. So, um uh, there is nothing corrupting Ahab. Ahab is well corrupted already. He's already abandoned the Most High. He's already in communication with this foreign king, and taking his daughter is just a, another step. And so what we find is that Jezebel supports an existing diversion from or, or rejecting of the Most High. She's not introducing it. She's... Uh, Submitting to it, she's she's, she's a, in agreement with her husband. We we learned from Amos tells us very early: two can't walk lest they be agreed. This is an agreed couple. This is this is not a a, a couple that's in disagreement. Uh, so, the reimagining of Jezebel as the culprit in this has to be revisited, not because we want to rehabilitate her, but because we need to be very careful about what we are assigning. To Israelite women, when you talk to an Israelite woman and you say, oh, she has a Jezebel spirit, what do you mean by that? Who was Jezebel and what, what correlations are, are you, are you um, commanding or inferring by using that? It, unfortunately, it makes the person sound very unlearned about our own biblical records to misuse an, uh, you know, an actual person in this way. So we need to really kind of um, evaluate the way that we're using and misusing anyone, including Jezebel, uh, just because we want to make a point or, as Amuna said, we want to shame or somehow terrorize or manipulate um, the feminine principle by plucking out, you know, whatever uh, image we want to. And Jezebel does provoke very specific images. And the fact that one of our sisters said whore, now that's, that's very interesting. This idea that Jezebel is a whore is one of the more pervasive of her assignments in, in popular in popular popular reimagining that she was a whore. But there's really nothing in the account that says that she was salacious or lascivious in any way. But there is um sort of um an assignment put on her because the way she faces Doom is that she first becomes very aware of her appearance, and so the pulpit has forwarded the idea that her her goal was to seduce Jehu, who was coming to uh, obviously unseat her, and 
that makes uh, the the account itself does not give any credibility to that theory because of the way she speaks to him. There's nothing, there's nothing gentle, seductive, lascivious, or affectionate. She says nothing to Jehu that would um, endear her to him. Instead, she immediately likens him to another person who's a traitor on record to the northern kingdom who usurps the the lawful um, regent at the time. So she is being deliberately vicious to him in her language. She's being deliberately demeaning to him in her language. So the idea that she uh, took time to do her makeup and her hair had anything to do with seducing the man on the you know, outside the palace walls, it, it doesn't line up. It, it, it's it's uh, intellectually just dishonest. And so uh, in this case, in this, this is why we say that there's a responsibility of the people to know our records and not to go on rhetoric because the research is going to be in the research that we can do the reclamation and the rebuilding and the restoring of our authentic identity as Israelites, as descendants of the people that we claim. So we have to do, if we're going to do our ancestors any any type of honor, then we need to actually read what they put on wax for us to understand. All right. Now, thank you for that, Sister Mariana. You brought up something uh, very interesting. And since you're on the relationship challenge, there's something that I wanted to uh, go back and, and highlight is that she was in league with her husband. There's a thought, I don't know where it's coming from, floats around, that <sighs> yeah, a good wife is to be in league with your husband, whatever it is that he says. When she came to his aid, and like, why your face look like that, boo? Mm-hmm. She was in she, she she wasn't coming beasting. She wasn't the, quote, angry black woman. She wasn't any of these things. She wanted to fix his problem. He had a problem. He was the king, and he looked sad. And she came and she conspired. She used the, the principle in a negative direction. That mm-hmm. aid, that azir, when we look at Hebraic principles, they can go in both directions. Mm-hmm. And she took her principle as this wife, this aid, this 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 help, as a lot of people like to say, and she took it and she's like, I'm gonna I'm gonna make you okay. I'm gonna she's help the you. Ride out. or die. She's right. She became his ride or die. Another um, point that was brought up that I think is worthy in another space is that she there's a probability that in other spaces, not is in Kingdom of Israel except for when Israel is following the other nations, but in the other nations to disobey a commandment for the king. Mm-hmm. That to them is like your king is your power. Your king is your quote unquote God. So mm-hmm. she's coming from another space in where they didn't take lightly at quote disobeying a commandment from the king or request from the king. Right. So the possibility that she's reacting so you know like oh my what no worries right. I got this and she's she because he's the king of northern tribe and he's like yo I humbled myself to this dude. Right. I didn't even beast on him. You know what I mean? And she's like, what? And he still didn't give it to you? Cool. Right. Again, when we put these things into context, we realize that, A, yes, she was a foreigner, and they went by a whole different set of rules. Mm-hmm. And this is came up in conversation with why, and we had this conversation, I think it was in the first season, and I, and I, and I got some slack for it, but it's okay. The thought of someone being brought in bread and Torah and that you can equate that person with someone who says, I'm just going to subscribe to the man. Mm-hmm. And the reality is the Torah says, teach your children the way in which they should go so that when they're old, they will not depart from it. We often have conversations about, is it the husband's responsibility to teach the wife Torah? And we've come back saying that the woman is supposed to already know Torah before she arrives in his household. And a lot of the problem and issue comes in is when the man is trying to come into the space that the parents should have already done. So what, Je- not Jehu, what Jezebel is referring to is the teachings of her parents. And this is why, as, as uh, in my Yehudi just said, the Torah has a prohibition on marrying certain nations. Now, we like to get, it just says these seven nations. But if we look at the principles of what the Torah is saying, it's giving us wisdom in an area. If we want a certain amount of longevity 
if we're just returning back to the law, statutes, and judgment, it's not very wise to keep starting at ground zero. Once you once you come into this space and you have other families that are raising their children in Torah, ultimately you want to marry your child to a Torah mandate individual from another family. Because when these two families come together, now that's Torah-minded. But if you keep going for the person who just wants to be with the man or the woman, you're going to find, I can't go over grandma because grandma be cooking pork. Oh, when you go over grandma or grandpa, don't eat, the, don't eat the thing in the bowl, that shrimp. You understand? We continue to find ourselves in this space when we say it doesn't matter. I know if I went on a tangent, hope I didn't lose anybody. I'm back now. Our brother Awar, our I know you said you wasn't really familiar with the story. What were your thoughts so far on what has been said? Feel free to oh. share at this time. And if you're on the line, press 1, and we're going to come to you it's after this. Right. Uh, yeah, I wanted to say this, right? Um, we also have to examine, like when you go into Revelations, the reason why uh, Jezebel is brought up again, because it's, it's going at a, a spiritual wickedness aspect of it as well. And like that scripture you quoted earlier in Apocrypha, which is uh, Ecclesiasticus 26, verse 23, it says, A wicked woman is given as a portion to a wicked man, but a godly woman is given to him that fear of the Lord. Now, it's also a case to that where it's not just talking about relationship-wise, but actually the Most High can use a woman, not that you're intimate with, but actually deal with a bunch of ideologies, and fornication spiritually, like you have, for instance, you have people out here now, like I've had this happen in Israel. You had a woman, it was a woman that said she could read, you know, like read the future or, you know, do things like that. And they had brothers be going to these women and following these women. They had a woman in California that was doing that fornication where she said she could, she had an angel come to her and was telling her things about certain brothers. You understand? So you have that kind of wickedness going on too. So the most high, Knowing our hearts, when he knows there's a certain particular guy that have a desire for those sciences or that spiritual fornication, and here I have somebody come and tempt you with that, and I'm going to prove it right here. This is Second Chronicles 18.18. This says again, he said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne, and all the hosts of heaven stand on his right hand on his left. Then it says, And the Lord said, who shall entice Ahab, king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one spake, saying, After this manner, and at another saying, After that manner. Then there came out a spirit that stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of the other's prophets. And this is what Jezebel did too, because she was deceiving people with that God they all. So the Most High also used these type of people as a weapon to deceive you. So let me read this right quick, and I'm going to pass the mic. This is uh, Proverbs 8, verse 23. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproof of instruction are the ways of life. To keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman, lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. Like, for instance, like Beyonce, right? A lot of people like her, but she's a witch. But she's very attractive, and she's seducing everybody through that music with, about witchcraft and turning them against the Most High. That's a great example of a Jezebel spirit. Then it says, For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to the piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. So adultery can also mean spiritual fornication as well. I just wanted to put that out on the table as well, but I passed the mic. All right. Thank you for that, Brother Awar. And, yes, you bring up something that is present today, and I have seen this in different spaces, which is women. And, again, we, we have to look at, um, hopefully we're going to do that, look at harlot where it can be spiritual harlotry, or it can be physical harlotry. And the most I let us know going after, you know, or spiritual fornication, which is going after all of these other deities. And there's a, a thought that floats around that her harlotry or her being called, um, I, I want to get the exact term, because she was called something in, in, the, in the latter part of the, the dialogue before she passes away. And this is what translated as she's a 
she, you know, people take it as physical hardship. But what you brought up, Brother Awar, concerning women, I've seen this, which is going after these different, quote, sciences and being more, not, not only just the women, but being susceptible to certain whims of doctrine. Like I've, I've witnessed this, I've seen where it can take you. And, and as you said, and, I, and rightly so, the seducing of minds to go, you know, just, just dabble over here a little bit, just touch this a little bit. You understand? And so that I understand, is, is, is that a Jezebel spirit? Did she hide and do what she did? Or was she outright with what she did? And this is what we're discovering, truth or trope, as it relates to Jezebel. Did she seduce the nation into idolatry? Was the nation already into idolatry? And she furthered that idolatry? I know it sounds mm. like, are they, you know, why are they doing all this? She's Jezebel, she's Jezebel. But again, if you, you know, you can't just throw all the stuff on her back and skate her down the block like Azazel. You have to say, okay, the truth about it, because we try to absorb ourselves of guilt. The nation, as Sister Mayana brought out, was already in idolatry before Jezebel comes on the scene. This is why they're attracted to, at a certain point, this conversation. Did she have to hide and deceive them? Or was this something that she now came forcefully? Because if she came forcefully, then was she hiding and deceiving? You understand what I'm saying? So if you say a Jezebel is a cunning individual, and then you have somebody that's brash, is she a Jezebel too? Like, which one is a Jezebel? The cunning one who's secret and knowing Delilah? Or the individual who's coming straight for the head and saying, this is what it is, you know? I know it sounds like we're splitting hairs, but it's important as it relates to the women who are out there and who are going to be labeled or who have already been labeled to really have this conversation like, which one is it? Cause, and the question is, can it be both? Sister Mayana, can it be both? Can Jezebel be both cunning um, and brash, you know what I'm saying? Can she, can she uh, the, the, the historical one, the biblical one, does she occupy both spaces? Not sure if Sister Mayana is there. Sister Mayana, are you there? Yeah, Mayana, are you on the phone lines? You there? I, I'm here. I'm here. I can I can I wait in about five minutes? Just give me a moment. Okay, no problem. So, Brother okay, Scott, we're gonna go to the phone lines as we are going back over the story, truth or trope. We're talking about Jezebel, and then we're gonna get into the Jezebel spirit shortly because there's some who will say you have Jezebel, and then you have the Jezebel spirit. And they're not the same thing. So I'm going to go, you know, a quick search will bring up some of these things about the Jezebel spirit. There have been articles written and books done all about the Jezebel spirit. So we're going to see where are they getting this from. So, Brother Sal, you can check the phone line and see if anybody has any questions or comments at this time. All right. Once again, we're going to the phone line, y'all. So this joined in today's show is entitled The Jezebel Spirit, Truth or Throat. The number is 319-527-6239. Feel free to call in with your questions and your comments. Again, once you dial it, you gotta press number one and that'll let me know that you have a question or a comment. For those that's listening on Skype, oh, just press number one on your phone lines as well. And that'll let me know that you uh, have a question or a comment. Let your voice be heard live on the Big Talk Radio. Let's go to the next caller. Let's go to four four three eight one five. You're live in the air. Yeah, hey, Sal Showtime. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, this is a good discussion. At first, I wanted to say that the Jezebel, who she was, was more like a first lady. Uh, I think the church has defined it as the street girl when she's really like the the person in political power. Uh, And since Israel is a religious nation, she's more like a first lady of a church or a first lady of a, a nation. Or a queen That's really what she is uh, That's the truth of the matter People are not talking about So because the one in political power Has the most influence Not the girl on the street So I would say this uh, What did Jezebel do? It was an unlawful union, number one So therefore it's like two guys getting married Two women getting married That's adultery, fornication Any kind of way you want to color it uh, it's still sin, and it's more like fornication or idolatry. All of it's the same. Idolatry, fornication, adultery, all of it is really the same type of sin, you know, um, because, you know, the Bible says the law is spiritual, you know, the most high spirit. 
So therefore, he sees things in the eyes of the spirit. Of course, then you would say it happens in the flesh as well because it's an unlawful union. And because of this unlawful union, it led Israel astray. And we see what she did. She tried to do to Elijah. She threatened to kill Elijah, one of the greatest prophets of the Bible. So I definitely would say that she was definitely uh, a wicked, a wicked lady. I definitely would say that. Uh, but a lot of times Israel don't recognize the enemy. They like to point at the woman on the corner instead of pointing at the people in power, you know. But that's what we do all the time. But I just wanted to say that I think that is true. Who she was was true. Uh, she did. It, she really was a whore in a spiritual sense and in a carnal sense because it was unlawful union. Uh, however, was she a whore in the sense she cheated on her husband? No, I don't believe that. <laughs> no, she didn't cheat on her husband. <laughs> so I just wanted to say that she wasn't a whore in that sense. You know, a lot of people just misinterpret stuff. But yeah, I just wanted to say yeah, I think Jezebel had a bad influence on Israel. Um, and I think, but King Ahab was a wicked man in the first place. So he, so they, they belong together because King Ahab was wicked. So if you wicked, you go get a wicked spouse, right? So they belong together. So that's all I'm saying about that. Thank you for that. That was the voice of Brother Mercy. There you have it. Brother Mercy is weighing in. He doesn't think she was a whore in the sense of a physical whore. She may have been into idolatry, you know, and tried to bring or advance, really, idolatry in the nation, because as we know, the Torah lets us know it was already there, where she tried to wipe out the servants of the Most High, um, and she succeeded to a certain degree, and some were hidden and preserved, and so she was very aggressive in her um, forwarding. So, Brother Ksala, do we have any other callers with their hand in the air? Ah uh, yes, we do. We got some more callers on the phone line. Let's go to two one five eight two seven. The live in air. Two one five. Shalom, shalom. Hey, shalom. How you doing? Uh, don't I share? How you doing? I got on a little late, but uh, I I did chime in on the portion where uh, the one sister was asking the question: um, Is is the Jezebel both? Uh, I, I forget. The way she worded it, but yeah, um, it is both. Like uh, I was mentioning about the people, did they want to be seduced, or you know, were they forced into it? It was it was, it was all those things because it's, it's the, the the Jezebel doesn't really have too many boundaries. Okay, so you know, it's, it's capable of anything. So you know. You know, basically, there are no, I mean, there are no uh, ram boxes to Jezebel thing in. The person has political power, not the woman on the street. But no, I mean, as we can see, the woman on the street does have access to political power based on all of the scandals with uh, the most, some, of the most, some of the most powerful people in political uh, position. So these women do he do even have access to those people as well. It all depends on how savvy, how smart they are. But you know, it's a matter of um, nothing is beyond the Jezebel. I mean, you even got uh, Kerry Washington kind of playing playing that, and like what's that, The West Wing or whatever that movie is. I mean, whatever that TV show is, it's it's also that as well. So you know, like I said, it's 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 it's, it's no limit. To the Jezebel, she's all things and everything. Uh, you know, you know, wow. whatever you can touch. touch <laughs> Thank, you. Right. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> so the Jezebel is she's Alicia Keys, Superwoman. I'm um, every woman. She has the extra chest. Wow. Yeah, she, she black uh, this, this is why we're bringing this up because is this a and thank you so much for your comment. Are we broad brushing the Jezebel? Like yeah, like is this a you know a catch all? Yeah. So everybody, every woman whose behavior I don't like, you a Jezebel. This is why we're discovering or having a conversation. Is it truth or trope? Because the real life Jezebel, the biblical Jezebel, she didn't have to do all those things. She came yeah. with political power. Her being there was a sign of her political power. The alliance or the agreement or the marriage between these two powerhouses. People like to talk about economic powerhouse. This is the real economic powerhouse. You have a princess, 
of a of a, a sea fearing nation who's big in economy and commerce, and then you have a king of the northern ch- kingdom. And again, that's like somebody brought up brother uh, Mercy brought up Beyonce. This is like Beyonce and Jay Z marrying. Both of them are into their own little thing. So she doesn't, Beyonce really, you know, technically doesn't have to beguile him. She can get whatever she wants in other ways. So so it is with Jezebel. Did she really have to come off her throne, or was she using her power behind the throne to be able to get her way? Do you understand what I'm saying? This is This is the question, because if we say the conniving woman is the Jezebel, she didn't. She went to the husband. She was like, "Stand by." Yeah, <laughs> that's what she told him. She was like, "Stand by," and then she went and did some nefarious type things. In her mind, she had the power to do so. You she see, had the as support. opposed to the girl who's trying to come up, she's gonna use, you know, you know coupons. <laughs> Everybody knows I'm being nice tonight, but she's gonna be using, you know, front coupons to try to work and wiggle her way up the ladder. That's not necessarily Jezebel, Sister Mayana, What are your thoughts? Am I am I reaching on this one? Am I reaching? And if you're talking about what's literally written in the text, then no. Um, what you're doing is is being true to the text. A lot of what we're hearing is um, kind of fleshing out this otherwise very vague notion of a Jezebel spirit that isn't mentioned until the New Testament. There's no mention of a Jezebel spirit. All of the things that are in terms of idolatry, harlotry, and all of these other things are attributed to Yisrael and Torah without Jezebel's appearance at all. So there was no need for this foreign princess to come and, and introduce something that we're now having to use her name to to um, label this idea. This is something that Israel had already been been charged with long before Ahab decided to to go get wifed up. You know, before he decided to boo up with uh, the foreigner, we were already accused of all these things. And as we've been saying. Um, Ahab had all the northern kingdom had already been well introduced to idolatry. She didn't do it. She's not the one to do it. And again, and I think we need to emphasize that we're not saying that Jezebel was a wonderful person. We're saying that if we're going to have, in order for, again, it goes back to diagnosis. If we're going to talk about how to cure um, what ails us as a nation, then we have to have the correct diagnosis. We cannot keep talking Jezebel, Jezebel, Jezebel. Jezebel didn't do it. Jezebel had the support of her husband. Let's not forget that when Elijah went and completely decimated her prophets, her husband went and snitched to her she didn't know the reason there was a hit put out on elijah is because ahab went back and said yo he killed all your prophets this is not something jezebel did let's not forget that when when jezebel didn't have a problem with nabal she didn't know him from anywhere it was because her husband came home not wanting to bathe not wanting to eat he's laying on his backside she said what's wrong if your husband came home, wouldn't eat, wouldn't you know, wouldn't wouldn't eat, wouldn't do anything, moping around the house, she said, "Yo, what happened?" And then he, like like uh, Imuna correctly re, um, reenacted, he moped at her. She he whined and complained to her, and she said, "Yo, but I got you, I got you." And let's not forget this 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 very the, the parallels between what happened with Jezebel and Ahab are almost letter for letter what happened between Esther and Xerxes. She is. She was, but she was on our side, and it's different because she was on our side. She went into, except she, she went into this marriage and refused to give up her power. She refused to betray Israel. She married this foreign and refused. She brought everything with her, everything that her her um her cousin taught her, everything that her peoples taught her. She brought that into her marriage, but because she was on our side, it looks great. It looks great. This woman did the same thing. She married a foreign, a, a foreign king. But the, the problem is, the, the the masculine principle who should have been repping for Israel wasn't repping for Israel. In, in the account of Esther, the feminine, the feminine principle repped hard body for Israel. We don't see that in Ahab. And the problem that I'm hearing is that we're having difficulty putting the culpability at the foot of the man, and instead finding all of these reasons. To blame it on her. Let's not forget that when she goes to to uh, tell her husband, stand by, I got you, she sends out things under the power, not of her own name, but of his name. 
And what's interesting about that is, like, okay, fine, you know, she, she, uh, I guess you want to say she deceived the people. That's a fair argument. We can argue that she deceived the people because she goes under her husband's name. But what's interesting about that is that when she receives the response, she receives it. Now, if you consider this, if I send out a message in Sal's name, in Amuna's name, in Awar's name, the expectation is the people think it came from that person. So would I be the one that you respond to, or would the response come back to Amuna? A wa or so. So it's interesting that she had the that, that she already had the ability to have these people respond directly to her. No one was cons- at this point. Israel was not looking at her as the foreigner, and they were supposed to. Instead, Israel had embraced her because uh, uh, why? Because Ahab had also embraced her. This was she didn't she didn't stand out. She wasn't an oddity. She was the same. We had it, it says in in first I, I'm pretty sure it's a twelve chapter. I'm going to look this because the don't my get the wrong information. But when when um, Jeroboam introduces these calves, Israel was well pleased. They immediately took to these foreign idols. No one had to convince them. Jezebel is not one of the senior. This is the first king. What is um, Ahab is what the sixth or seventh king? So if Israel had already abandoned the Most High, had already abandoned our tradition, had already abandoned our customs, we had made it a ripe situation for Jezebel. Jezebel didn't come and do anything. And instead of trying to blame it on outsiders, we really are going to have to take some accountability and say, you know what, we called that on ourselves. We called that on ourselves. Ahab brought her to us. And Ahab was fine. Elijah could have gotten, he snitched on Elijah. Elijah had to run for his life because she put a head on him. Because Ahab said, Ahab is the one that told. That's crazy to me that we're having this conversation about what was Jezebel doing. Jezebel, like Amunah said, was doing what Jezebel was raised to do. We are the ones that were doing the wrong things. We're the ones that were doing the crazy things. We're the ones that went against our power. That was us. None of us stood up and, and, and behaved like, like Hadassah did in, in the face of Xerxes. She's in a foreign land with a foreign king, with a foreign husband, and still didn't give up her power. Let's have that conversation. Well, why, why, we, don't, we don't have conversations about how Hadassah or about her onesies with, with only Mordecai whispering little things to her here and there to the point where she was like, you know what, I got this. You go tell them that at one point Hadassah flips the whole thing. She flips the whole thing and says, you know what, I got it. Like, you don't have to come whisper anything else to me. I know what's going on. And then he, and Mordecai starts to listen to Hadassah. So we have to stop trying, to, for, for me, not because, for, this is my, my, my position, is that we don't need to rehabilitate Jezebel. We need to rehabilitate Israel. Whoop. Sal, you don't have, like, one of them crackly things or, you know, some, some ring, something, that, that was fire. <laughs> Nah, you gotta provide that. You gotta provide those special effects. I don't have those. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what Sister Mariana just said was fire right there. At the end, is that there will be those out there right now listening, thinking that going into these spaces is to make Jezebel not that bad, when in reality, it's taking away the crutch, stripping right. away the shield, stripping away the people and the things and the thoughts that we hide behind so that we don't do what is right. And the reality is, as she said, Jezebel's representation in the nation, her ability to get a stronghold in the nation, came straight from leadership. We see it, we see it time and time again throughout the country. And that meant another, another day to see why is it that um, oftentimes when the, in, in, in biblical narratives when the kings got into spaces, they married foreigners. And why the Mosai, when he talks about the priest, the Mosai specifically tells the priest who is, the, who is supposed to be the example of holiness in the nation, what to do and what not to do. The king does the exact opposite. <laughs> he was like, you know, and he goes out and makes these alliances for one reason or the next. And Jezebel is no exception with this type of political alliance. So I do believe we have some hands in the air, Brother Sal. Look out for, uh, I believe, also Sister Aisha. She texted me. Her hand is also in the air. So we're going to go to the switchboard at this point. Please weigh in. What are your thoughts? Are you upset that, 
you know, you know, sometimes we're saying something and someone may hear it in a totally different manner. And that's okay as long as we're willing to respectfully have the conversation to see what you're hearing versus what the individual says because it's all about edification. So, Brother Sal, the mic is yours to the phone line. There we go. We got that fire right there. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> I mean, we got the hot tea fire right there. But uh, let's go to the um, next caller. Let's see. Let's go to 313-695. Live it there. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've been chewing at the bits <laughs> to stay on the panel. Oh, this is really this is exciting. This is Yahudi again. Yeah. It's, I agree with you, sisters. It's all through the scriptures. Every time the children of Israel sin, he sends somebody to capture them, to discipline them over and over. It's all of our responsibilities. We need to stop being narrow-minded when it comes to the quote-unquote Jezebel. Men must take responsibility for their actions and not for looking at the woman And see, it's being read on a male perspective and point of view where the minds need to be open and recognize the reality is that Israel, like Manana said, is we are responsible. I was saying this early on the conference call. We have to stop pointing the finger at other people and look at ourselves and what we need to do to prove who we are as a people. We're supposed to be like priests among the nations. And that's men and women. But y'all covered so much that I forgot a lot of stuff I was going to say. So, <laughs> <laughs> when, when the brother got on, I was like, no, brother, Jezebel, no, she's not like that. You don't get it. You don't get it. You have to change, too. I have to change. Everyone on this line must change if we so desire and call out to the Most High. So simple to change your way of thinking. You can't put it all on the woman. It's, that's not what it is. And Imuna not, and Hallelujah. point in what they're saying. I put the torch to the youngins. Okay. Shalom. <laughs> I want to I wanna, uh, you know, address what um, Ima said. What Ima said is correct because what she says is that we need to, to look at ourselves and reflect from there. And with interesting and what's important about the account that we're discussing is that Elijah goes and meets Ahab at Naboth's vineyard because Jezebel had successfully stolen it <laughs> by killing him. And um, it's interesting because the text says she tells him, you are the rightful heir. Now, this is the reason why Naboth did not give up the land is because it was his um, ancestral space, and we know from numbers that you cannot give that away. So he was standing on the Hebrew principle, which and Ahab understood that it was a Hebrew principle. This is why he was so defeated in the moment, because it wasn't that um, Nabal was just being insubordinate, is that there was a biblical, there was a Hebrew principle, an Israelite principle behind it, and so he couldn't go against it. This foreigner didn't have any understanding or appreciation of it. It's clear that Ahab didn't give her any of that background, so she she uh, successfully does this. Now, my point is that Elijah goes and meets Ahab in the vineyard, and he pronounces um, this curse on him and his family. What Ahab mm-hmm. does right there, right then and there, is what we are not doing in this con- and Many of us are not doing in this conversation. He rents his clothes. He repents. Mm-hmm. He recognizes his part in it, and he yes. repents. And what the Most High says to him, he said, you know what? He goes back to Elijah. He said, you know what? What I said I was going to do Ahab, I'm not going to do to Ahab. It's not going to happen in his lifetime. Instead, it will visit on his son. Why? Mm -hmm. Because Ahab didn't say it was the woman you gave me. Ahab did not say Jezebel came through black girl magic. He didn't say that. He was like, you know what? I messed up. Mm -hmm. I messed up. He humbled himself. And the Most High said, I see you. And it didn't visit Ahab, and it didn't even happen in his lifetime because of his repentance. But now the children of Israel, the descendants of this very account, are still trying to blame Jezebel. Mm-hmm. And that if we are going to pay attention to our ancestors, let's pay attention to what Ahab did after. 
Mm-hmm. He said, yo, it's my bad. I brought her here. I did these things. What happened to, to, to acquire this land was bad business. I was wrong. We're not doing that. Again, if we had read the account, if we were reading what's going on, and I can do this from the dome, not because of, of any reason other than I see it all day. We have memes about Jezebel. This whole I wrote a, a counter meme just because it was so frustrating to see that they found this Jezebel thing. And then it looks like somebody looked up the DSM-4, 5, or 6, whatever they're up to, and looked up narcissistic uh, personalities and just tucked everything under it. Any possible thing that may, if you, if you were to go line by line down the things that you, we, we assigned to Jezebel and then go to the DSM-4, which is the Diagnostic Manual uh, for, psych, for psych, Psychopathology, you will find that dollar for dollar is exactly the narcissistic uh, spirit or whatever but this is not jezebel jezebel wasn't magic jezebel lived and died jezebel pronounced a curse on herself because she told elijah that she said after you killed all my prophets if i don't do the same or, or um to you by this time tomorrow may the gods do to me that and more so obviously elijah doesn't die the next day <laughs> and so she calls down this this curse upon herself we have a habit of doing that. We, we, we say too much, and then we call down things on ourselves. Jezebel does that to herself. Jezebel is not black girl magic. Jezebel is a regular Phoenician doing her regular business. She married Ahab and did a, what do you expect Jezebel to do. Not because she had a spirit on her, but because she was a foreigner, bringing all of her foreign things with her, just like Hadassah did. Hadassah didn't have any spirits on her. Hadassah was a good Israelite female. She did what her job was. To rep for Israel, her body, no matter who you're with, where you are. If Hadassah had gone, oh, that's my husband, let me submit to some of everything, then Hadassah would have been supporting Persian rule. We wouldn't have expected Hadassah to do that. We liked that Hadassah kept, kept her power with her and all of her traditions and her upbringing with her. And we understand it when it's Hadassah. We have to keep our minds about us when we're understanding our the things that we're reading. These are our ancestors. We have to stop romanticizing our ancestors and pretending like they were infallible and that they needed outside influences to corrupt them. Ahab wanted to do it. Ahab was with somebody he wanted to be with, and he understood it, and he repented, and the Most High saw him. That's what we need to do. We have to yeah, yeah. repent and move from there. I'm gonna and I'm gonna let the callers go back because I want to go and dis- discuss this idea of the whore because this is when we go back into the antebellum South and why this is a big deal. Like why is Maya and Amuna making such a big deal about Jezebel? Because this person Jezebel, who we hear about in First Kings and then later in Revelation, she doesn't die there. She later right. becomes because it's a spirit in Revelations that she's got like a half a second in Revelations, nobody knows what to do with the spirit all of a sudden. The spirit doesn't get to stay a spirit, it becomes a body. You know whose body? The melanated woman's body. All of a sudden we're the Jezebel. And because you've already called her a whore, the, the the melanated woman becomes a whore. And what happens when you are a slave and you have this other oppressive spirit a, a oppressive regime around you? We're gonna talk about that, but I know I don't wanna take the platform wait, wait, away from the callers. No, we definitely are because this is this is as you can see, you know, bring it all out, <laughs> bring it all out. One thing feeds into the next, and again, you know, some a lot of people reject other other melanated peoples and other communities reject the Bible because on the basis that the Bible being misused was present to deny that it wasn't present to do what was done through um, the transatlantic slave trade is either to be you know. Uh, unaware of what happened or willfully ignorant of what happened, you know. Mm-hmm. So definitely we're going to go into that. Before we do and touch back the phone line, just to substantiate what we were saying about kings, I, I love reading Proverbs. Proverbs is one of my Jesus, you know what I mean? And I read it over and over and over and over again. And as I was talking, I'm like, wait a minute. Solomon was saying the same conversation. And any time I come to this portion in Proverbs, i got to look sideways because if we remember the story correctly, we weren't supposed to have a king at all. But listen That's to right. the perception of a king. This is Solomon, who was a king of the United, the last king of United Israel. And this is his thought. He's saying, this is a proverb. This is a wise saying. Um, Proverbs, what is this? 16 and 14. 
the wrath of a king. That means you don't want to get the king mad. Remember, the king went and sold. Jezebel is taking this as she got mad in the space where, as Mayanna rightly said, Ahab realized, or Ahab realized that, you know, according to Torah, he really shouldn't be mad. It says, the wrath of a king is a messenger of death. What, mm. you upset the king? That's your life. But a wise man will pacify it. Meaning, whatever this individual asks you, because they wear the crown, you if you want to live, you do what I say. Okay, so it's not a totally foreign thought that Israel began to adopt that. they And, they, and the king is not supposed to make up rules. The king is not supposed to make up laws. He's supposed to he's supposed to judge by the Torah. But when the king got into the space, more often than not, he began to make up laws. I wanted to read one more because, you know, two or three witnesses. Proverbs 19 and 12. The king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion. You know the lion that Saul likes to play. The king's <laughs> wrath is the roaring of a lion, but his favor is as dew upon the grass. So in this thought of having this monarchy and having this system where you are lonely and you're the servant to the king to deny the king mm. according to Solomon is not an easy matter. And so when we go forward now the whoever somebody's line may need to be muted. Your seven kings down, thank you, into um this this division and rightfully so nothing but idolatry from the top. So you know they ain't going by Torah. Ahab doesn't do it, or Ahab in this case doesn't do it. But this queen who comes from another space who may have shared these thoughts about kingship, she decides to do it. And I'm not sure if he told she told him what she was going to do, but, you know, I, you know, I don't, I'm not sure where his objection was to whatever it is that she was doing. And, again, we can surmise about that and get lost in the woods on that one. But to stay on topic, we're going to go to the phone line. Let us know what your thoughts are so far. Again, if you want to chime in, you can do so respectively. If you don't agree of why um, all of this is wrong and the Jezebel spirit and you want to lead us into the Jezebel spirit conversation, it's open. So go ahead. Uh, Brother Sal, can you check the phone lines for us? All right, once again, family, the number is 319-527-6239 to call in. Uh, we're going to, uh, we have like 20 minutes on the air. Just letting you know we have 20 minutes on the air, so, you know, let's go to the phone lines. Let's go to 347-303, you're live on the air. Shalom, this is Saish again. I want to uh, shalom. Shalom. that, uh, Shalom, this is Something that Mayana, can you guys hear me? Because I have on headphones. I just want to make sure I can be heard. Yeah, we can hear okay. yeah, I'm going like to slight. I'm going to hear like a slight echo as well. So maybe I recommend mute their phones. Oh, let me let me take it off. Okay. Better now. Let me uh, yeah, echo where yeah. it comes from. You just go ahead. Is the echo? Is the echo is still there? Is the yeah, echo I'm still there now? Yeah, yeah, I'm still hearing the echo. It's just probably too well, many speakers open or phone lines open. But no, nah, you okay. could. You could. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. The problem yeah. is, is that, like what you guys are saying, Israel never want to take responsibility for what we do wrong. And this is why we're still in this captivity. The whole idea of it's just like as though something's going wrong. And what we tend to do, especially those of us who still observe the New Testament, it's like, oh, well, it's a spiritual thing. Okay, it may be a spiritual thing. However, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's um, someone went and, and, and did voodoo or opium on you. So that so that's a, if, if I can't think of the reason why the Most High may not allow something or why I'm not succeeding in something, the quickest thing I can do is accuse somebody of doing voodoo or witchcraft on me because that explains away something that I don't have any control or an answer for. And just like how with the whole Jezebel thing, Jezebel was a wicked woman. You know, the brother, um, her husband, I guess she's married to, I think Ahab, was weak. And he fell into her, you know, her manipulation. But like you guys pointed out, Ahab was wrong as well. He was doing wickedness. That's why it wasn't hard for him to get with a woman like Jezebel because that's what he wanted. 
and he was not doing the laws of the Torah. He was probably going against it. And, you know, but it's the excuse that we try to make, and that's the reason why we are caught up in this situation till this day. And the Christian church, as far as the way they would describe Jezebel, they would say, oh, you know, that's like more of a whoring woman or a disobedient woman or a woman who's wicked, as they would put it. So, you know, to you know, to give, to scare women into or, you know, accuse women and, oh, you're being a Jezebel. So, but the thing about it is, is that in many cases throughout the scriptures, even with, um, you know, our ancestor Samson and Delilah, it's when our brothers went against what Yah said and got with foreign women in the first place, you know, and, and they were wicked in doing that. And then, you know, following these women or whatever. But see, it's not the women. And that's what people who don't take accountability for themselves get caught up in. It's the idea of you going after a foreign woman in the first place, you not doing the law and obeying the Yah in the first place that would that would tie you into somebody who is who is doing wickedness because that because like you said, Jezebel was not an Israelite. So she's not held accountable to the commandments. We are. So like Mayana said, it's not Jezebel that needed to be rehabilitated. It's Israel that needs to be rehabilitated. And you see this behavior even today. Excuse me. Blaming others for when things go wrong. Some sisters do it because they come into this way of life. Well, I didn't know what, the, what about this culture, and this brother brought me in here, and he told me this. But whose responsibility, if you're going to be praying and, 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 and accepting something as your spirituality and your way of life, then, sister, you're responsible for knowing about the Torah, reading it, and understanding it. You can't totally put that on a man. And um, in retrospect, vice versa. When a brother brings a woman into this and he gives to her his interpretation of the scriptures, per se, and he's trying to use it as a controlling method to get her to do what it is that he wants her to do. We don't call that a, a, a seduction or a manipulative spirit or a Jezebel spirit. We say, oh, that woman was foolish, which she is being foolish by not taking responsibility for herself and her beliefs. However, men and women both do it, use anything they can to manipulate you know, the other sex to get them to do what they want because control is an issue too. But the thing about it is, is that, and like I said earlier with the brothers, you know, oh, this sister is wicked. She's this, she's that. So, you know, okay, she's wicked. Well, brother, when you really listen to the stories, and I'm sure we all have, a lot of times these brothers knew what these women were about before. You know, if you're if you're laying with a woman and you just met her 45 minutes ago, evidently this is not wife material. But because you wanted sex and you wanted to be, you know, hypersexual, she's good enough for that. And then if you marry her and things don't go correct, then it's like, okay, well, you know, it's this woman that I got with. Oh, it, you know, she's the problem. No, you're the problem. So, you know, it's about individually taking responsibility for ourselves and collectively taking responsibility for ourselves. And I think Mayana hit, hit it right there in the head. Israel needing to rehabilitate and change not blaming outside forces, it's, you know, it's our fault. And individually, we need to do the same, men and women. And then we will start to get back to what we're supposed to be as a nation underneath our Elohim and doing the right thing. Thank you. Well, that's the voice of Sister Aisha. Now we're talking about self-accountability. What? No, Azazel? If I say you can't skateboard through the wilderness or somebody's back, we haven't heard from Brother War in a while. Thank you for that, Sister um, Aisha. We haven't, Brother War, we haven't forgotten you. Uh, Brother Southside, there's 15 minutes left on the air, so if you don't call in after that, I didn't even realize the time just flew, but there's 15 minutes left on the air. Brother War, what are your thoughts so far? Has you learned anything new about the Jezebel spirit? Is it truth? Can we use her as a blanket, a catch-all, and everybody's a Jezebel? Or is it is that intellectually dishonest, historically dishonest, to use the label because it's comfortable um, to apply it to people that it's not applicable to? Brother Awoy, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, I was thinking about, like, um, when people are saying, um, did I hear echo? Yes, echo. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, I was just saying, um, I hear a lot of people saying, uh, ah, this echo. You can go ahead and get somebody else because I got to fix this echo. It's driving me crazy. <laughs> Hello? Brother Sal, are you there? Yeah. Can you hear the echo, Brother Sal? Yeah, I'm here the echo as well. Um, but we do have a, a mafia on the line. Brother um, Matia. Okay, let's see if we hear echo on Brother Matia. Welcome to the conversation. We are speaking about the Jezebel. We didn't even get all the way into the spirit yet. We're still on, the, and I knew this was going to happen. We're on the biblical Jezebel. Uh, welcome to the conversation. Uh, Jezebel spirit, is it truth or trope, Brother Matia? The mic is yours. Thank you so very much. I just want to make sure that I I understand the question. Is the Jezebel spirit what now? Is it is it truth or trope? Like again, we're we're examining the biblical Jezebel and the way in which Jezebel has been used um, in popular media culture uh, amongst the church. Is it accurate? Can we say that's actually the Jezebel spirit, or is that something else? So we're just spending the the opening part of the conversation looking at the historical biblical Jezebel um, and just trying to flesh that out. So you can weigh in. And, and I kind of ask everybody, when, when you hear the word Jezebel, I'll just start there. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear someone say Jezebel? We can start there. The mic is yours. Well, when somebody normally says Jezebel, in my experience, you're talking about a woman who's loose, you know, somebody who's fast or, um, you know, sexually promiscuous. That's my experience when somebody says that it, that they are, you know, talking about a woman who's a Jezebel. Um, but the biblical Jezebel wasn't really associated with somebody who was um, loose like that. I'm sure, you know, it hints at it, but more so it talks about how she was uh, a follower of, of the island, you know, strange gods, and she led Ahaz away from, you know, doing God's will. And I guess that can come in many different forms when it comes down to a woman or a man, you know, to be honest with you. You know, men can also lead good women astray, uh, away from the will of the Lord. So it's not, it's definitely not limited to just one sex. But that's normally my experience when, when someone says or, or talks about a Jezebel spirit, somebody, a woman who's very re- rebellious, and who's uh, sexually promiscuous normally. normally. Here in all night, there's clearly two different Jezebels. If you can remember at all, do you know where you possibly got the the, the, the thought process of the sexually promiscuous Jezebel? Like, where, where did it come from the church? Did it come from, you know, teachings? Did it, where, 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 if you can, uh, pinpoint where in your experience did this thought process come from? Uh, it most definitely came from the church, I would say that, but um, society took it around with it, and Jezebel just came to me the catch-all phrase for a woman who is promiscuous, you know, promiscuous and who's pretty much fast. Um, that's what Jezebel pretty much meant, you know, a woman that was, um, who, who definitely wasn't going to be faithful. That's what it meant normally. Um, but it, it did come from the church, but, you know, society took it around with it and added layers to it. Okay. But it's definitely not limited to, it's definitely not limited to um, women when you look at what Jezebel did. You know, Jezebel had, priest, you know, priests who followed her. So it's definitely not limited to, to just women leading the church. So you're saying men could be Jezebels too? Absolutely. Interesting, interesting. So much for that, brother Matia. Sister Mina, what are your thoughts on that? The, the the process that men can have a Jezebel spirit on there. Have you heard that before? Is that something that you would subscribe to? What are your thoughts? I absolutely reject it. And uh, yeah, it's something that I have um, seen. Again, I tell you, they began to uh, mushroom this sorry, Jezebel this, spirit. I'm sorry. Did you say you rejected it? Absolutely. I reject Uh-oh. the idea that the, because it, it's not the Je, Jezebel. I reject the notion of a, a Jezebel spirit to begin with, in terms of this historical um, 
this historical person. We have a historical personage here. And so I understand that later, much later uh, in Revelations, there's this Jezebel spirit. But even in, in studying um, or in any kind of cursory research about this idea of the Jezebel spirit, it's not speaking, again, this is not even referential to the historical Jezebel of kings. In first or second kings, this is um, according to Christian theology, a new uh, Jezebel who's happening or emerging in that particular time and space, and not the ninth century BCE Jezebel. Um, and to, to the point of, I know that I've said it and I haven't shown it, so I want to give you very briefly, very quickly, because I know we're leaving the. Um, we're well, coming on the 10 o'clock hour. But as I said, it is actually in First Kings, the 12th chapter, beginning at the 26th verse, where we see Jeroboam, the very first king of the northern kingdom, introducing uh, the worship of foreign deities. This is not something that Jezebel comes and corrupts Ahab. She doesn't seduce him. She doesn't make him do it. Um, Ahab is very already very much entrenched in this um Departure from our from the true and living power. And reading from twelve and twenty six, and Jeroboam said, in this in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. Of this pe- if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Elohim at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn unto their power, even unto Rehoboam king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Robam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, And the other he put in Dan, and this thing became a sin for the people, went to worship before one, even unto Dan. So the people had left under the counsel of the the very first king of the northern kingdom, who was was operating under his own insecurity. This is the very first time that this the neophyte kingdom of the northern kingdom in, in, in its efforts to establish themselves. He's the very first king. This is a new thing to be a northern kingdom separate from the Davidic empire. And he was afraid that if the people left to go to do their, their rituals and sacrifices in Jerusalem as they were accustomed to, he would lose power over them. And out of that fear and out of that insecurity, he built two idols and introduced it to the people, and the people would have it so. They adopted it. Jezebel's not on the scene. Ahab's not born yet. This this is not because Jezebel came and did anything. Israel did it. And because Israel did it and stayed fine with it, that we get an Ahab. Who's, who and by this time, after generations and generations of seeing this, is so comfortable in his in his denial of the true and living power that he can go and deal with this foreigner who doesn't know our ways. Ahab knew that what he was doing with with Naboth was wrong. Jezebel didn't know that. That's when we talk about uh, what what are the the drawbacks of marrying foreigners like this. Is that if he had married someone who was Torah scented, who knew our customs, she would not have been like, "What? Why are you so upset? Let me, let me, let me. I got you, boo." She wouldn't have said that. She would have understood. Oh well, you know, I feel you. I see. This is what we can do about it. No wonder you're depressed. But she did wonder because it didn't make sense to her. Nobody in Phoenicia would do that. So this, these are these are the things that we're talking about when we say Israel has to take responsibility for what Israel is doing. And not point fingers and, and start, um, you know, assigning things to a Jezebel spirit. And I, you know, I know that we're coming on the 10 o'clock hour, but I really want us to talk about what the dangers are of dealing with it. Amatia made the, the, uh, the great point that, yes, although the pulpit has, has fed us this idea or, or, fe- or fleshed out the Jezebel spirit mentioned in uh, Revelations to mean all of these other things, 
that in doing so, society has, has, has taken it and applied it in very dangerous ways, specifically to the melanated women. And, for, and we find that melanated women are, are, are among the biggest culprits of calling other women Jezebels. And say, oh, the Jezebel, you got a Jezebel spirit. We, we, again, I think it, like I think you pointed out when you, because we want to deflect it from ourselves. No one, no woman wants to be called a Jezebel. It's one of the most powerful things in the arsenal to call a woman Jezebel. You know, the brothers have Eve. You know, you're supposed to be insulted if they call you Eve. You should be insulted when they call you just foreigner Jezebel. Most, most, some, most Israelites that I know, the women are like. Jezebel was a foreigner. I don't know where you're going with that. But there's still a lot of melanated women who think that this Jezebel spirit, this Jezebel insult carries a power that doesn't reflect very poorly on them. It's, it's The fact that it's bad scholarship and the, the fact that historically this was meant to to demonize and vilify specifically melanated femininity. And to, to the point that it... I'm going to just say, because I keep saying I'm going to let other people bring it out, but here's the thing. Because of this Jezebel trope, because of this Jezebel spirit, melanated women are have have no legal recourse when their bodies are defiled because the Jezebel spirit has been assigned to her. Because the spirit can't, can, it, spiritually, it remains abstract. And when it's abstract, it doesn't carry the same amount of potency as when you give it a body. So society has given it a body. And that body is yours, melanated woman. And so when we had um, women who were enslaved women being raped by their their European owners, what he would do as the assailant as the attacker, he was able to create this, this atmosphere that he was the victim, that she had seduced him, that be, due to the savage and, 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 and inherently wickedness of, of the melanated woman, that he just succumbed to her seduction because she's so salacious and, so, and lascivious. And so there was, there's no recourse for raping Melanated women. Even now, there, there, if you, are, there's the articles that will support that. When surveying people in general, melanated women do not get viewed as victims in sexual assault. It, it, we don't even have to go to surveys. How many? We look, look. Even now, we look at popular culture. How many women will defend R. Kelly? She must have wanted it. Right, we we see the male, the masculine principle. The first thing we want to do is we blame the feminine principle. We did it with Tyson and Robin Givens. Robin Givens was immediately the seductress. She's she's a B. She's this and a third. And so Robin Givens got no no sympathy, no compassion, even among women, when her, when she was assaulted, because there's still this assumption that melanated women deserve it, that we call it onto ourselves. This Jezebel trope. Is, is is vicious and malicious for many, many reasons. The reason why we're asking the listening audience, asking each other to really look at what was going on and to whom culpability and accountability must fall is because it's dangerous. It's dangerous to your daughters. It's dangerous to your wives. It's dangerous to your sisters. You must arm yourself with truth. If we're, if we're looking for our men to defend us, our men have to get better information. We can't keep telling you how much we need you and, and then listen to you reproduce bad information that works against us. It's, there's nothing to Google. The, the laws that were put on the books that say that women can, that particularly melanated women cannot, it was, it was at, at some point legal, legal to rape melanated women. The assumption is that she deserved it. The assumption is she is so lascivious, so salacious. She is the ultimate seductress. There's something dangerous about melanated femininity, melanated sexuality. All of that got attached to Jezebel. There's a danger in making something that abstract and that vague and not taking the time to research. Zeho. Thank you for that. That was the voice of Sister Mayana. We are 
at the 10 o'clock hour, she went into something, and the way the conversation is going, you know, that that would be like a whole other conversation. And I agree, it's, some, it's a space that when we bring it up to today um, and see why it's important, these are the reasons why it's important. I just want to make sure that we do, we're not going to get cut off. Let me check on Brother Sal, because, you know, once I go in that area, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm holding myself off, you understand? Brother Sal, um, how we doing on time? How we doing on everything? Yeah, just so you know, we are definitely off the air right now, so uh, we are in the 10 o'clock hour, so we only got a, a few minutes left, of course. But, um, yeah, we have some more callers standing by to say, you know, as well, so it's up to you. All right, see, y'all got it on and popping. Um, yeah, uh, we're, we're coming to the, we're coming to, we're going to, Brother South said we're winding down. So I noticed we, since Amanda went to the area, she's like, I can't hold off no more, I'm going there. But I just <laughs> want to say, you know, again, yes, as we fast forward today, and then we're going to come and take brief comments or questions from the callers. When we fast forward into today, and even during the time of antebellum slavery um, in the West, the thought process, as she correctly said, was actually the, the melanated woman could not be raped. Rape right. didn't apply to her because as property, she couldn't be raped. And so her womanhood was questioned when she was assaulted, as Mayanna rightly said, when she was assaulted, when she was uh, exploited for her reproductive labor, it's because, you know, she wanted it or uh, I own her and she has no right to her own body. And this conversation has transferred over in today's space and time. There's actually a book on it. Um, there's many books on it, but there was a story in particular uh, that this conversation came out in, and it's called Cecilia the Slave. If anybody wants to look it up, Cecilia the Slave is actually on record of a young woman who was tired of being raped uh, by her master, and she planned. She had two children by him, if I'm not mistaken, and she planned to take him out if he came through again. He came through again. She took him out, and can you guess what? the jury came back and said that she was convicted of murder and they took her life because they said that the rape laws didn't apply to her because she couldn't be raped. Black women are not. So when you see a lot of this stuff, even in today, in the media, in the news, and as she said, the conversation and the narrative about if something happens to a melanated woman as opposed to if something happens to someone of another nation, and especially if it's a European, the, the narrative changes. The melanated woman, she wanted it. The European woman, she was a victim. But we'll have that's a whole nother conversation for a whole nother day. So we're gonna go to the phone lines right now. We're talking about the Jezebel spirit, keep it uh clean, professional, short and nice and concise. Brother Sal, you can go to the lines at this time. All right, let's go to three four seven seven three one. You wanna Okay. Uh shalom everybody. This is Ima Naami. <clears throat> Hope everybody's doing well. Yes, ma'am. Hey, shalom. Um, Hey, I've heard so many good things, that, and I certainly agree with you. Um, you know what it's analogous to? Um, when a man is um, doing dirt to two women, and instead of them going to confront the man, they go at each other. They want to see each other down. They want to kill each other, you know. Instead mm-hmm. of looking at the source of their misery and blaming this man for bringing misery into both of their lives, no, they go at each other, full-fledged. Then, as you say, we don't take responsibility for the things that we do. I mean, this, when you think about it, and, and like she, uh, um, Bayana read, uh, and I believe uh, Imuna brought out as well, that the king is the ultimate authority. You can't disobey the king when he gives a, a, a command. It's just like Bathsheba. She knew mm. nobody puts her in that same light. She knew that she was a married woman. And adultery was wrong, even in, I don't even know what her pe- where, where, where her people was. I don't know whether she was an Israelite or a foreigner. But even in the foreign nations that surrounded us, adultery was a wrong thing to do. So now when the king summoned her, though, what could she do? This is another reason why Yah says about the shepherds, why he's going to, call, call, why he's going to hold them responsible, because mm. if a king gives an edict, you have to obey it. You know, unless they tell you to do something, this is why in the case of Daniel and Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael, the, the, uh, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, why mm. they, they, they were uh, looked at as such great men because they defied the king. 
of the Persians. You know, they, they, they defied them and said, no, we're not going to do this thing. And that was unheard of. You know, you don't defy a king. And look at the case now. You talk about the king having the power. What did the king of Persia do when, when Vashti got all up in his face and she, she, she you know, she, she, didn't, she didn't come when he called her? He got rid of that woman, got rid of her right away. You understand? So the king had that power. Ahab or Ahab had the same power. He brought that foreign woman in there. She, he knew what she was all about. Yod, he went into the nation that Yod told us not to go in. The Sidonians, or the, as the Greeks would call them, the Phoenicians, were people that Yod told us not to go into. And he went into anyway. And he had a history of it. Because when you think about, when you think about the, the fact that that Simeonite brother went into Cosby, who was of the same people, in front of the mm-hmm. people in the wilderness, you understand what I'm saying? It was the same kind of situation. He had a very bad, you know, he had, um, Pinkus, Pinkus the priest got his everlasting covenant for having done this guy in, for doing the very same thing, a foreign woman. So, yes, yes, of course, she influenced him. We understand that. But it wasn't her spirit. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't that person can pick up a Jezebel spirit. Anybody who introduces those things to Israel can have the same kind of spirit, not naturally attributed to Jezebel. But what we miss in here is that Ahab was the evil one. He went against the rules of the Most High. We can say that Jezebel didn't even know them because she comes from a foreign people. He knew the rules, and he still broke them. And he didn't worry about breaking them because this was the woman that he desired. He listened to her because he wanted to, he, didn't, he didn't want to do right. At the end, just like Liliana pointed out, or uh, um, um, I, I can't remember which one now because I was I was just trying to listen while I was driving and everything like that. And then, of course, I'm old anyway. But what happened is that they pointed out they pointed out that you know uh, he repented at the end and he did fess up. Listen, I did this thing. What did it? Would that it would be that a lot of our leaders today would do the same thing? Mm. And I and I'm not trying to. Um, cast the Spurgeon or anybody and whatnot, what have you, but, I mean, you have to tell it like it is. A lot of those leaders that have led our people astray and have caused them to go into the wrong kind of worship, they don't own up to that. Some of them are walking around with titles of great men, and believe me when I tell you, they've done a lot of damage to Israel because they've led them in the wrong way. And so, again, I do agree with uh, BT Yaisha when she says that accountability is very, very important. You know what I mean? God's not going to judge you on what somebody else does. He's going to judge you on what you do when it comes to weighing your own soul in the balance. So this is a point that we forget. But I, this is a very interesting conversation. I love hearing this. This is uh, something that I think should have been explored a long time ago or that I'm so glad that it is being explored because a lot of times we're getting these labels put upon us and we're getting uh, women off. Uh, 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 vilified in so many ways based on some description, wrong descriptions, mind you. Because just like you said, the brother came up and he's talking about he thinks of a loose woman, he thinks of a promiscuous woman. There's nothing in there in, in the narrative that says that she was promiscuous or loose. Just so that she instituted the, the, the worship of Baal and, and, and forfeited it. In fact, she didn't even institute it. It was already there. You know, what's the that? That while we were in the wilderness, we asked a- Aharon to make us a calf. So what new? Nothing new. <laughs> Again. So let me get off the phone because I tend to go on and on and on. If you don't stop me, you know, I'll be here all night. So let me get off. <laughs> Thank you for that. That was the voice of Iman mm-hmm. Naomi. And going in, because this is, this is the hard truth. We're talking about the relationship challenge. These are the stumbling blocks that are hindering us, and the relationship is not just man and woman relationship. I know we've been dealing a lot with that in the first two seasons. It's not just man woman relationship. Once you pass man woman, it's, per, it's, it's it, whatever relationship that's involved in the building of the community. It could be sisters. It can be brothers. And we know we're beginning to have shows that are dealing, pinpointing that specifically. And so, you know, thank you so much for that, um, Ima. Because, once again, it's not to point the finger, but it is to take responsibility and stop using these, this rhetoric as, mm-hmm. uh, 
reasons not to take the responsibility as as the the little you know escape door the Houdini escape door like you could be like a shaggy it wasn't me you know what I'm saying <laughs> the, the whole it wasn't me thing is not working anymore it's not getting us anywhere I know we're running out of time brother Sal you could go ahead for another call all right by the way we lost the war it's called drop we lost the war but we appreciate the brother for his input and uh, of course uh, we're gonna take maybe two more calls and after that we're gonna pretty much uh, get some last words from everybody. Take two more calls. Let's go to two one five eight two seven. You're live in air. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, don't I share again? I was um um the comment the the very last part of my first comment that I made earlier was um, the, the Jezebel is all things and everything. So, but mo- most mostly is a trap. It's a trap. So. You can use you can use a, you know you can use your creative mind to figure out all different types of traps that are out there. So it was mentioned about can a man be a Jezebel? Well, yeah, he can. You know because it, it's it's almost like you know the, the, it's, it's it's um I, I forget the word to use, but it's a like you can trap yourself. You know, like you can run from yourself, but you're not gonna get far. You know, you can wear out a thousand thousand pairs of track shoes, but the bottom line is, like like it was mentioned earlier, if you don't make that change or that adjustment, um, then you know you're basically always going to be falling into this trap. So you know you're, you it's it's like having a predisposition to do evil uh, in the face of the creator. So with all the different traps that are out there, you know take your pick. You know the the, the straight and narrow, which is the law and the Torah. Is the only way to mm-hmm. escape it. So, with the now, I got two little daughters. I had all sons, but finally, you know, I got knocked over the head with two little girls, and it's like they're like one and well, two and three, well, two and no, two and five. I'm sorry, but I'm developing an onslaught of wisdom. So when they get of age, you know, I'm basically gonna let them know. Listen, these are the facts. Do not go into any intimate situation. Where you and a man alone, unless you plan on having sex, okay? Do not do it unless you plan on doing it. Do not do it because, and then I'll just go into the variation of traps, and basically you'll come out on the losing end of the stick because of uh, perception, mentality, and everything out there for you. These are the traps that are waiting for you. So once you basically let people know and give them. Uh, the true logistics and dynamics of the traps that are out there waiting for them or what to look out for, then, you know, that's a tool to kind of cause them to be more wary and on their P's and Q's. And ultimately, even if you're weak, you know, you can at least have a blueprint of where you take your first steps, your second steps, and then eventually, you know, hopefully you can become um, – a lot more savvy to where or you can avoid the traps before they come or you can, or you can actually see them coming because you recognize what they are because you're educated about what they are. But um, I would say this, this Jezebel conversation, you can't limit it to anything because there's no boundaries. It's, it's and you know, the most high is all things and everything, but this Jezebel trap is, 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 is up there. You know, nobody's, nobody's uh, above, um, this um, this trap. Yeah, but that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carla, for your call and your thoughts. Definitely gonna have to explore this more at another time. Um, but for now, we're gonna go to the next caller, Brother Sal. All right, let's go to the last caller. Let's go to two five two two six six. Go on there. Hello, everybody. I was just sitting here listening to the call, and I'm just I, um, I'm in agreement with a lot of it, uh, mostly, uh, um, you know, about the brothers and responsibility for themselves. I see a lot of blame being thrown and also thrown <laughs> at the Jezebel spirit. Um, I remember, and um, I, I find it interesting because when I was in, um, I was in school. Me and my friends took a real interest in the Jezebel spirit because <laughs> we had a we had another friend and we wanted to know what was going on with her. So we had this dictionary 
of demons. And the Jezebel spirit was named in one of these, you know, as one of these demons. And I found it. Um, I still have the book, actually. And one of the um, attributes of Jezebel was that she um, destroyed, she was operating through a curse, destroying Yahuwah's order and the family priesthood. Now, how can she do that if that power was not given to her? That power wasn't given to her. And it was given to Ahab as the king, as the king of Israel, as an Israel man. How can that blame be placed on her? Like, <laughs> I I just... I don't understand. I think it's really misplaced. The, the term is really misplaced in the Jews. And, yeah, that's, that's that. I found it interesting also that she's not Israelite. She's not an Israelite, but mostly Israelite women are um, compared to Jezebel or say we have a Jezebel spirit when she's not even in our lineage of women. So that's that. Great point. Thank the caller. And, and as you said, you know, I know there's there's some who will may want to make her, you know, all things and everything. And I and I appreciate your input. But you know, to be to be uh, more historically accurate or biblically accurate, she had power. She was a queen. There, you know, how many and this is how many spaces in the Torah does is reserved for an Israelite calling her a queen. I, I, that that would be a little Torah trivia. How many? So this is a foreign woman who who receives you know this this queen process or this thought process and and wields it around as such. We see her Dasa going into another nation and being thought of as a queen, but we really don't see it amongst Israelite women in the nation. And so you know it's a whole other study. But again, we can't blame anything. The long and short of it is to blame everything on the Jezebel is not to take responsibility for the things that we choose to do and continue to do as a people. And so I'll get last words. I wolf um, dropped off. I'll just get last words. We'll check on Brother Amatio. Your last words on the conversation. I know you came a little late, but we still appreciate you for coming through. What are your last words on the conversation, Brother Amatio? Yeah, I most definitely came a bit late. Sorry about that. Had some, you know, OT to do with the job. But I do like the whole, um, everything that I'm hearing as far as taking responsibility. And um, I think that is the first step in um, rebuilding a black family. If anybody knows me, they know that that's one of the things that I like to trumpet a lot is to say that, you know, we won't get anywhere until we fix the home, you know, or, or you know, the, the dynamic as far as what makes a home. You know, to get together and to make that fa- make sure that fathers are fathers, mothers are mothers, and children are children. And once once we start to do that and put our aim on that, then everything else will fall into place. Especially if we keep the middle class for us. So with that, you know, I'll just leave it there. But thank you. Thank you for that, brother Matia. Uh, see, he coming through, doing overtime at the job, still coming through. Thank you so much, <laughs> Anna. What are your last words? I know you wanted to go another direction. We might have to pick it up. On the other side, what are your last words? Um, I guess most we covered was biblical. Uh, um, Jezebel, what are your last words uh, or last thoughts on the conversation? In keeping it um, on the historical Jezebel, I think that we need to, again, be historically honest about her participation, her part, and what went on in the ninth century BCE and kind of just keep it there um, before there was a Jezebel, there was this kind of rebellion. Before there was a Jezebel, Israel had already, um, on several occasions, all throughout the Torah, even before we talk about the kings, um, this uh, rebellion against the Most High, the rejection of the Most High, the refusal to do what we need to do, and this this uh, this deep-seated um, desire to search out other things. And so... Because, like you said before, because Jezebel has become comfortable and convenient, we keep using this name. And the fact is that this was a thing before she was a thing. And um, 
I think that this Jezebel idea has to be retired because it comes with so much baggage, and we need to look at these other things. The reason I was bringing it into contemporary times and trying to show you or show the audience where it, how it affected slavery, the fact that this uh, slavery became eroticized. In that way, first among um, they thought that white slaves were considered erotic and beautiful. The, histo- the history of white people is a, a great book that shows how Europeans began to eroticize the enslaved female body, and how that just transfers over to the melanated woman and excluding her from this what's called the, the cult of true womanhood and the like. And so, uh, to 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 wrap up, um, we want to be very aware and to be well versed in the historic the historical accuracies in order for us to teach anything, male or female, there's always other arguments about who has the right to teach. This the the, the misinformation about Jezebel, that didn't come from Women that came from the masculine. It was, I think, one of the emails, but this is coming from the masculine gaze. This is coming from the pulpit. This is not coming from women are not the ones that are disseminating this kind of bad information. And the the uh, idea of the woman made me do it that has to be retired, and we have to take personal accountability. The men love authority, but we're not hearing a lot of accountability, and we need both. And you know, they will. All righty now. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and give it to everybody. Have a blessed night. And I'm going to give it back to Brother Saab. Brother Saab, the mic is here.